usually slot machines based on my favorite movies are good luck. At least that's what they want me to think. So continuing where we left off, Aragorn and the Four Hobbits all leave the Prancing Pony and head towards Rivendell. And Beren was a mortal man. But Luthien Tenuvio was the daughter of a king of elves. Yet she chose to be mortal. For him. Oh, I see what they're doing here. They're setting up the love story between Aragorn and Arwen with this campfire story before we meet here at Rivendell. <laughs> What? Arwen's not in Revendell in this version? She's gotta be somewhere in this movie, right? <laughs> what? She's not even in this movie? Okay, I guess they're saving her character for part two? <laughs> oh yeah, that never happened. Well, this scene feels a bit fillery. Maybe it's here to set up something else. And when he died, she followed him. And so he was her doom. But he was her love as well. I thought I saw something. Hmm? <laughs> okay, what the hell was that about? I know gay jokes have been made before about Frodo and Sam ever since the Peter Jackson's films came out, but this? I don't know, this happens right after Aragorn tells a literal love story. This feels very intentional. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Frodo and Sam being gay on its own, I mean, I'm not with that crowd. Although there are themes of love in this story, the Lord of the Rings is predominantly about friendship and bonding together during dark times, and Frodo and Sam are the antithesis of this theme. Frodo is just simply not meant to be gay. Or a tart fetishist for that matter. Oh my god, I actually wrote that. So then their campfire is interrupted by the Black Riders who have been following them the whole time. Now I should probably talk about the character design of the Black Riders since, you know, they stick out like a sore thumb. They look fine on their own, I mean, they're pretty green for Black Riders, but I can kind of see how I'm supposed to be intimidated by these things with their glowing red eyes. However, much like the people at the Prancing Pony, the Black Riders look way more obviously rotoscoped than the main characters, clashing with their design. It's one thing to do this with characters that appear once in the story, but these are antagonists that are essential to the entire trilogy. Why would you make him look this out of place from this universe? So, not a whole lot here changes from the book. Frodo puts on the ring, realizes that the writers was Kangs and shit. Okay, I'm never saying that again. And then Frodo gets stabbed. Aragorn then explains to Frodo just how fatal of a stab it really was. What's the matter with him? It was only a little wound? It was an evil knife that struck him, Sam. <laughs> I think that a piece broke off in the wound and is working inward. Now, it's at this point of the story where help arrives in the form of an elf. In the book, it was just some random elf named Glorfindel. In the Jackson version, he was replaced with Arwen. However, since Arwen is not in this version of the film, it's actually Legolas that comes to help them. Not a bad change considering the fact that he would later become a member of the Fellowship. Now before I show what Legolas looks like in this film, I should probably explain what an elf actually is in the context of Tolkien's Middle Earth. Elves are a race of creatures blessed with immortality and eternal youth. And what gift would a dwarf ask of the elves? Except to look upon the Lady of the Galadrim one last time. For she is more fair than all the jewels beneath the earth. <laughs> Basically, if you were an elvish woman, you were beautiful, and if you were an elvish man, you were handsome as hell. So like I said, Legolas is our introduction to the elvish race in this version of the film. So... What kind of character design did they give him? Bruh, look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the f <laughs> No 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 <laughs> What? What's up with his eyes? Why are they so crooked and spread apart? What's with his mouth movement? Is this seriously all you're gonna do to make him distinct from the other races? This shit's laughable. May go Barnum. Yes, Sam. That's an elf. I mean, I was expecting a bit more, but... I guess this one just has fetal alcohol syndrome or something. But the sight of Legolas is able to make Sam happy. So happy, in fact, that he makes one of the strangest and unexplainable noises I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, 
God, this movie's weird. Anyways, despite the fact that Sam has, up until this point, worshipped elves. Me go and see the elves? Oh my! Oh hooray! The first thing he does after meeting Legolas is argue with him. Well, Mr. Frodo's been on the road a lot longer than that, and he's sick and he needs a rest. Oh yeah, that's smart. Your friend's badly injured and you expect him to just sleep it off? I'm sure there's no fatal consequence for that option, except for the one that was just explained to you a moment ago! It was an evil knife that struck him, Sam. I think that a piece broke off in the wound and is working inward. God, Sam is such an idiot in this version! Jesus Christ! And just when they spot Rivendell, the Black Riders catch up to them. The future king of Gondor, ladies and gentlemen. You're not gonna win any battles by running in front of a horse without using your dagger. A day may come when the courage of men fail! So after that happens, Legolas commands Frodo to flee, and then Frodo is just... alone. There's no scene of him riding away, the movie just jump cuts to Frodo being alone with the Black Riders. Pretty damn disorienting. Go back! Whoa, was that a female Black Rider? Go back! Huh. How strangely progressive. I'm not trying to be sexist, it's just... Sauron never really struck me as the kind of guy who would put women in power. Now, I don't really have that much to criticize about this scene. It's actually one of the few genuine highlights of the film. In this version, Frodo actually manages to defend himself against the writers, much like in the book. By all the Shire, you shall have neither the ring nor me! Some might say that this is one of the few scenes that Bashki did better than Peter Jackson. For me personally, it kind of feels like a double-edged sword. In the Jackson version, Frodo is knocked out the whole time, meaning we don't get a badass line from him, but that scene just did a better job at giving you a sense of danger. For the first time, we see how the evils of Mordor can have an effect on a single person, to the point where a single stab is enough to completely paralyze our main protagonist. And that blank stare from Frodo is a shocking reminder that he's slowly turning into one of them. I don't know, there's nothing really wrong with either version of this scene, it just seems obvious that one scene is at least slightly better than the other. So then the writers get washed away, Frodo passes out off of his horse, and then wakes up at Elrond's place. And it's here that I realize that we're not even an hour into the film and we're already at Rivendell, one of the pivotal locations of the Fellowship of the Ring. I don't know about you guys, but I just feel underwhelmed. So then Gandalf explains to Frodo what happened to him at Saruman's Tower. I rode at once to Isengard. And I thought that if anyone could know what was best to do with the One Ring, it would surely be Saruman the White. The great eagle Gwahir came in answer to my call and bore me away. Wow, that looks like a really dangerous and inconvenient method of travel. Like, he could easily just slip and fall to his death. And even putting that aside, it would still be really aching for your arms. Especially for a trip that would take hours or days or weeks depending on where you wanted to go. But I guess it would take more effort to animate Gandalf riding on an eagle's back instead of being carried by his arms. So then the main four hobbits start wandering around Rivendell as we see background characters that are distractingly under animated. This guy can only move his arm up and down and every other part of him is just static. Some people aren't moving at all. The only part of this woman's face that moves is her eyes which is unsettling. And this guy over here, <laughs> he's not even playing a real tune. He's just strumming the same strings over and over again, thinking that's a song. Though it seems to be impressing this guy... I think? I don't know, I think he's just frozen there. So then Frodo reunites with Bilbo, and we get to the part where Bilbo sees the ring for the first time in years. Now, when it comes to the Jackson version, I've seen a lot of different reactions to this one scene. Depending on who you talk to, this scene either scared the hell out of you when you were a kid, or just made you laugh really, really hard. My own ring. <laughs> I sh should very much like to hold it again one last time. You might have thought the CGI on Bilbo's face was goofy and over the top, and you'd be kind of right. <sighs> Yeah, you'd be right. But I would argue that this scene did a better job at communicating the ring's power than this. I'm sorry, is Bilbo possessed by the ring or is he just having a stroke? Jesus Christ, Frodo, are you about to deck your uncle while he's having a grand mal seizure? Don't make me break my foot off in your ass! 
I don't know, now that I think about it, they're both kind of on the same level of goofiness, so tomato tomato, I guess. So after that scene, we get to the meeting at Rivendell. All that morning, the Council of Elrond debated the history of the One Ring. Wait a minute, that's supposed to be Elrond? You look, uh, you look pretty human for an elf. Now, obviously this was made decades before the Peter Jackson films made the definitive look for each races of Middle-earth. But we still have descriptions from the book to go off of. The problem here is that this film doesn't really put that much effort into making these races look distinct from one another. And with the exception of the Hobbits, they all kind of just blend together after a while. Take this guy, for example. Take a wild guess as to what this character is supposed to be. Gimli, right? Sure, he seems a bit tall for a dwarf, but his beard, his helmet, and his armor look distinctly dwarfish, right? Nope, that's actually Boromir, and that's supposed to be Gimli. You see what I mean? Here is the sword of Elendil of Gondor, who fought the Dark Lord long ago and was slain. So Frodo learned at last the true heritage of Aragorn, the son of Arathor, descendant of Isildur, who cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand. You know, you didn't really need a narrator for that part. You could have just let Aragorn explain his heritage. So blah, 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 Frodo agrees to take the ring to Mount Doom to destroy it, and... You know, I just realized that there's no scene where the rest of the Fellowship agree to help Frodo. Just a single narration from Elrond, and after that, it's like they're all just kind of stapled to the mission. Hell, we didn't even get a line from Gimli during the Secret Council, so no one watching this version knows who he is or why he's agreed to this mission. He might as well be an extra in the background. So the journey of the Fellowship begins, and for some reason, everyone's character design is almost completely off-model. Yeah, for some reason in this scene and a lot of the action scenes, the main characters completely change and they look way more realistic than they did before. Why? Did they not realize that that would just make some of the most important parts of the film completely distracting? I mean, <laughs> some of this shit is just freaky! Right, so after everyone turns back to normal, they make a pit stop and debate whether or not they should travel through the mines of Moria. The question is not who wishes to go, but who will. What does the ring bearer say? I do not wish to go. <laughs> but I will go, if Gandalf invited it. <clears throat> yeah, remember earlier when I said that Sam in this version will contradict his role as Frodo's right-hand man? This is the kind of shit I'm talking about. Sam is now giving Frodo a look of disapproval just for listening to Gandalf. I can understand not wanting to listen to someone who seems shady as fuck and might want to kill you and take the ring for himself. <laughs> Because Master did not ask! He's up to something! But this is Gandalf we're talking about. The wise old wizard that all of the hobbits look up to as a mentor, including you! Oh, Gandalf will have that gate open in a minute. What if he can't? I have never seen anything Mr. Gandalf couldn't do. Yeah! Exactly! Are you really that disappointed he's taking his advice? So then we get to the part where Gandalf tries to open the door to Moria by solving a riddle. <laughs> Gandalf... You old fool. Mechlon! Wait a minute. I thought the elvish word for friend was Bella. Speak friend and enter. What's the elvish word for friend? Melon. Not Methlon. Mechlon! Gandalf, I think you've got some other shit on your mind. I'm a little concerned for you at this point. Here's your meth. And here's your meth dealer. And your meth boyfriends. And your meth baby. And don't forget your meth! meth. So then they get into the mines of Moria and sleep for a bit. Frodo then spots the eyes of Gollum from a distance and makes the exact same face he made in an earlier scene. Though to be fair, recycling animation was a common practice in animated films back in the day. Then again, I've rarely seen it happen in the exact same movie. So then they keep walking again. They make another pit stop and... Uh. You know, I realize that the book was a bit meandering and repetitive at times, but describing this movie out loud just made me appreciate how much Peter Jackson put in the effort to make these events entertaining to a film-going audience. They use the first pit stop as an opportunity to explain to Frodo what Gollum even is, and for Gandalf to hit home the message of the first film. I wish the ring had never come. I wish none of this had happened. 
So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Here, it's just bam, bam, moving on. This part of the movie may as well have been cut if it's going to feel that less significant. How was anyone supposed to interpret that that was Gollum following them without reading the book first? So going back to the second pit stop where Pippin starts acting like an idiot. Pippin! Oh, um, just a stone. I, I, uh, dropped a stone. Fool of a took! Throw yourself in next time! Be quiet! You fool of a Pippin! Won't you? <laughs> what a goofy and over-the-top reaction from Gandalf. It's like I'm watching a cartoon. Wait a minute. Also, if you're suspecting that the enemy was following you, and you didn't want to attract attention, why are you guys just sleeping out in the open? I didn't notice anyone was awake to guard until Frodo woke up. So then we get to the part where the Fellowship is attacked by orcs and cave trolls. And they're literally just dudes in cheap costumes that are poorly rotoscoped. Good job making these guys at least a bit intimidating. The Shire! The Shire! What? How do you even know what the Shire is? <laughs> Great job, Frodo. You didn't even try. Oh, I hope that thing doesn't get me. Oh! And I guess we'll just have to wait until later to explain to the audience that it was Mithril armor that saved him. So after they escape from the tomb, they get pursued by... Oh my god. Don't tell me. That's the Belrog? Okay, this isn't just me holding this film to the standard of a movie that would come out decades later. The book clearly states that the Belrog's size is greater than that of a man. And I'm pretty sure by greater, Tolkien didn't just mean a few feet taller than Gandalf. Also, it's literally just a dude in a lion mask with wings. What's supposed to be a ferocious beast ends up looking like a Quidditch mascot for Gryffindor. Go, go, Gryffindor. Go, go, Gryffindor. And then we get to one of the most famous scenes in the Peter Jackson trilogy. You shall not pass! Now, at this point, I wasn't really expecting this part of the film to be nearly as iconic as how Sir Ian McKellen would handle it decades later. And to be fair, William Squire does do a decent enough job with the lines he's given. I am a servant of the secret fire. You cannot pass. But the problem with this scene is that it just doesn't give him enough time to really shine with his performance. Because of the movie's shitty, let's get this scene done as soon as possible so we can have a two hour runtime style of pacing. And in this moment, it is here that Gandalf the Grey sacrifices himself to defeat the Belrog and save the Fellowship. Gandalf, a man that many see as a mentor and that the Hobbits have grown up with, has just died right in front of them. And not a single tear is shed for him. I mean, they barely show emotion for a man that they had known their whole lives. They don't even play sad music to emphasize the emotions of the characters. These wounds won't seem to heal. This pain is just too real. There's just too much that time cannot erase. All we really get from Frodo is this. I'm all right. What does it matter now? It matters. We still have a long road and much to do. Why? We've no hope without Gandalf. You know that, Aragorn. Oh, come on. That's not nearly enough emotion for someone who is practically family to you. Mithril shot. That's what saved you. And they quickly change the subject to address the Mithril armor. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want definitive proof that the heart of the original story was lost during the making of this film, look no further than here. One of the chief characters just died and the movie doesn't have enough time to give him a moment. For pity's sake. Ha! 